Well, I'd just like to thank Mo for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I gave a slightly shorter version of this talk this one's a while ago and, and Mo asked me to add to it so I, uh, I took the idea of features and technical debt and I added a few bits and someone had to point out to me that I've actually managed to come up with an acronym that perhaps wasn't quite appropriate. Um, so realistic is architecture wars, um, features, architecture requests and technical debt, I'm going to cover all these various topics. Um, as Mo said, I'm, I'm Richard Wilson, I work at a company called Desres. Uh, I'm going to get my thanks in at the beginning because uh, if there's anything wrong I'm probably going to blame them for uh, those particular mistakes. So Matt and Cliff have really helped me with this talk. I've got some aims um, I'd like to get over to you guys in this talk. Um, uh, the main one is about technical debt, uh, explain to you what it is um, and that uh, it's important to, uh, to address it at the right time and place really and that's what I'm going to really concentrate on in this talk. Um, and as part of that, it sort of it leads on to trying to explain the importance of architecting a solution. All, all us uh, developers want to get their head down and write code, but it's similar to what we've just been talking about: is uh, stepping back and actually having a, having some thought and trying to think of the big picture and doing things right rather than just quick. And there's a there's a good reason for that. You really, you really want to consider yourself as an architect. Don't just be a builder. Try and think of yourself as an architect with a set of plans. So I've got uh, uh, a structure to the talk. I'll spend five minutes talking about me and uh, yeah, my large ego. Uh, 25 minutes on uh, the main part of the talk. There's a break in the middle of that. There's a video as well, so it's not all me talking, don't worry. And uh, then some uh, uh, 10 minutes about some common mistakes and uh, then some questions at the end. So what I'm hoping is that through the experiences that I've had, you'll be able to learn from the mistakes I've made rather than make them yourself. So, start about me. Uh, um, so, to start off, I was the hero programmer. I've, I've been coding since the early 90s, and I started in Fortran 77. Yes, I am that old. Um, and I was working at, uh, at Swansea University doing research. Um, I was writing uh, programs that was helping to manipulate uh, three-dimensional data, put it on screen so you could see how it would move around. And you, know, you, you learned uh, code changes and I moved on to C and Visual Basic 6. And while I was there, I realized I actually enjoyed much more the actual writing of the code than I did actually doing the research. And the best part of that for me was um, I, I wrote the data acquisition software for the laboratory I was working in and it got accredited by Rolls-Royce. And it's now about 18 years later and they're still using the code. So them finding PCs that actually run it is the air issue. But I got an opportunity to leave research and actually do what I enjoyed, which was writing code. And I joined a startup, a .com, desres.com. So it's now 15 years old. And when we started, we're talking 56K modems, um, plugging the phone into these sockets and listening to the lovely buzz noise. Uh, IIS was just released by Microsoft. Netscape Navigator was the browser of choice. Um, and we were writing um, a web-based software. We were software as a service, the very, very first. We didn't even know that's what it was called um, when we were writing it. Um, and we knew that this was the future because we were lucky where we were at the university. We had a 10 megabit connection when everyone else was on 56k modems. So we could see that this was where the future was. So we, 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 we started with dot .com. And the business started to grow. The, the broadband started to extend out to people and 512 was available and the software started to become appreciated and people started to lose that fear of having an online piece of software. And so the tech changes, you move on and I was writing Visual Basic 6 ActiveX controls embedded in, now there's IE as the popular browser. And the company grows and the tech changes again and you move on to C Sharp, the power of the browser increases and you're writing loads of JavaScript. And it's getting bigger and bigger and the software is getting more and more large. And eventually we got to the point with the code that it's just tied itself in knots and it's unable to maintain and we're really struggling to add all the new features. And so we end up having to redevelop our core product. In the meantime, we've added some new products. We don't just do the one, we've added some others. There's a product called Desres PM, which is to do with property management. But realistically, what I want to talk about in this talk is the is the fact that we got to a point with our code base, it was so tied up that we've had to start again. So we've done reproduct development, really. And I'm going to go through, hopefully, the reasons why that's occurred. So this is just some screenshots from the new, write, the new product that we're writing, which is Resi. So this is the single page application. Um, so 
overall what I'm hoping to get through to you in the next um, 20 minutes or so is that I've, I've got some experience and I've seen how things evolve and things always change so the way you're working now won't be the way you're going to be working tomorrow it won't be appropriate so there's a time and place for everything so onto the main part of the talk so features versus technical debt um, I started off as the hero programmer uh, this isn't a picture of me honest but uh, that's your typical hero programmer and um, it's a nice place to be you're on your own you've got your small project you do what you want when you want it's it's, it's all your own domain um, it's all in your mind um, you know what plan but you can do what you want and change it and it's it's a fun part of programming but it's not sustainable as a business because you're the one person what happens when you're ill what happens when you're off or what happens when the demands start to exceed and you actually want to be able to sleep and you need people to work with you so the attitude and the way you behave as a hero programmer doesn't work as when you move into actually so like as a startup and you actually really want to have a grow a business so that's what I'm going to start talking about the the life cycle of a startup but I'm going to try and do it from our perspective from a developers perspective from instead of the business but before I do I will I will do I will do the opposite of that I will start to talk a little bit about about the business and you know, the standard startup life cycle discovery validation efficiency gains but I, I've got some problems with these buzzwords uh, they're wrong in my book and I just want to I want to get them off my off my chest uh, it's not minimum viable product it's minimal viable system your product needs to be sold it needs to be onboarded and then once you are they are using it you need to have support so the product's one part of the whole business so just thinking as a developer that all you're doing is writing a product is missing the point that the business needs to have the whole system working together for it to be a complete thing that can survive and actually pay your wages at the end of the day so that's one the fail fast and pivot that again anybody can fail fast the people that uh, make a go of things are the ones that learn from that failure and learn quickly. And then they start to change what they're doing and that's where the pivot comes from. So fail fast is missing the point again. It's learn quickly, that's what you want to do. And the low hanging fruit, yes, that's, that's completely true. You want to make sure you pick off the, the easy jobs first, but if you don't remember to go back, someone else will go and get them and then you're out of business as well. So. You've got to, as I say, it's a time and place for everything. The beginning, low hanging fruit, but remember to go back. Okay, now the business. Everybody talks about the startup and the stages of the startup from a business perspective. So I did a bit of research and I found three different models. There are 61 different stages uh, identified, and only one actually says anything to do with the, the, what we would be doing, uh, us sitting in this room. And that says back end <coughs> scalability improvements. Great. That's it. That's, a, that's us covered then for the whole life cycle of the startup. So I don't, that, that's not right. So I've got my, my I've, I think there are five stages really. And I'm sure some of you have seen this little cartoon um, before, but I think that sums up the life cycle of the code. Um, so I'll try and explain why, what I'm thinking with the life cycle of your startup, the life, life cycle of your code base from our perspective, from a developer's perspective. So at the beginning, it is a bit like being uh, the hero programmer. Um, you can just build what you want. It is, it's a fun time to be involved in the product. It's super fast, there are no implications, but that realistically there are no implications because you've got no clients. Um, so you can do what you want, change things, it doesn't really affect anything. And then you get a few of these happy clients. So it's still, it's still fun, it's still, um, it's still a nice place to be, it's still quite quick to respond. But you do have to have some thought now. You can't just drop a database just because you've got a domain model change because it's going to affect your customers. So you start to have to have a little bit of thought about what you're doing. And I should point out, these aren't, these aren't hard and fast lines that you go through. There's a slow migration through all of these. As you get more and more customers, obviously they start to make more requests. And you know they, they seem quite happy at the beginning because you can jump on their request, fix the bugs very quickly. But eventually you go, oh, well, actually, there's a, we've got a few problems there. We made this little change and that's caused us some problems. So it makes it a bit more difficult there. Um, but generally, it's still good, a bit, a bit slower though, and the customers are happy until you screw up, and then obviously they're going to moan. More requests come in, and now you can't keep up. And they start to say things like, oh, it's not like in the early days, you don't respond as quickly, why aren't all the features? I put a bug request in, and it's two months later, you haven't managed to fix it. And 
if they start to get a bit, a bit, a bit grumpy and you, you know you're in this phase when as a developer you go oh no they're asking me to work in that area I hate working in there I can't understand it if I start to try and change anything here who knows what's going to happen uh, and re really that's the first sign that your code base is starting to die because event eventually it's all going to be like that and you can't change anything anywhere because of fear it's going to cause problems so your product's dead the code is dead and your only real choice is reproduct development starting again so what's caused that slow decline and, and death of your product? And what it is, is it's technical debt has accumulated. So these are the small little hacks, these little, you know, little jobs, you just, I'll, just, I'll just do this, or something you didn't quite finish off and do properly. They all start to accumulate. And the longer you leave it to go back and fix it, the harder each one gets, because someone else will have done a, a hack around your hack. And they all just start to comp compile on, compound on top of each other and that is what is eventually kills your product now I'm not saying that you must never put technical debt in there is realistically one point in time when you've got to allow yourself to be able to put this technical debt allow technical debt and that's the prudent deliberate for a business reason and it's normally the case where the business is demanding of you to, to, to get something released as quickly as possible and in a perfect world you should turn around and say no we've got to do this pro properly but there is a business to run at the end of the day if this, this product doesn't ship money doesn't come in you don't get your wages but the important point is is that you should you should know when you're doing it and you should record it and you should put it on the backlog and you should have to be given time at some other point to go back and fix it because otherwise it's going to bite you on the ass and it's what kills the product it's not good enough just to allow, ah, oh, I didn't understand, or we don't have time, let's just get going, because those are all the ones. Every time you do that, that's another little chip away, that's another year off the life of the code base. So when you actually do get to this point where you're sort of starting again, you, it's new product development again, reproduct development, um, you are doing something slightly different than when you're in a startup. It's a very similar process, but in an established business, um, new product development is a bit different. You're, you've got a bigger group of stakeholders. You're obviously going to have bigger plans, I'll explain a bit more of that, and the balance between the tech and the business will be slightly different. So there are some sut sut subtle differences, differences. But you're still trying to do the same, same thing. You're still trying to um, discover customers and validate them. But obviously you've already got the scale of the organization is already there. And if it's actually reproduct development, you probably do know an awful lot more about your proposed solution. You know the problem because it's obviously got to solve the same one. And you know exactly the business model that you're trying to do. So reproduct development in an established business, um, I, I like this idea that as, as a startup, you probably wouldn't have got into this business if you knew everything about it. Unfortunately, in an establishment, you do know everything about it and you're getting all these facts blaring you in the face and it's quite scary. You'll probably underappreciate what the minimum viable, okay, that says P, but it should be minimal viable system, is required. As a startup, you'll underestimate what is needed. And equally, your customers themselves will probably expect an awful lot more of you if you're established and you're reproduct development than if you're a startup. So there are some differences. And it still comes down to this balance, though. You've still got to try and balance the business from the tech from trying to be as quickly as responsive as possible so you can get product out the door to having um, a technically stable solution with no technical debt. So it's always got to be this balancing act. And I, I think at the, at the, there are three real stages to that software development process. At the first stage, where you're actually basically creating your alpha product, the business side tend to leave us alone, don't they? they? They are expecting us to be working away and we can do our plan and we can, we've got time to do things and hopefully we are getting our minimum viable system um, ready for release. And it's this second stage when you actually start to get a few beta customers um, coming onto the system where you get the most pressure for this technical debt. Um, and it's actually quite predictable the business now is starting to say, well, when are we going to get this? How we need the people on, we need the money coming in. So you know you're going to get this pressure from them to do it. But you also know the types of requests you're going to get. And they're going to come in an order because there is an order to how a customer comes to you. So if marketing is unable to find people to buy the product, they're going to come to you with requests for features. 
And marketing is really is the one that should be the developer's friend because they're the ones that should be telling you develop this feature and we attract the biggest group of people who can buy it. That's different from sales. So once you've got people <coughs> interested in the product, that's great. So the marketing and the features you've got works. But the sales team start to say, I can't sell it to this guy because it's missing this feature. That's where you start to get, oh, uh, if, I, if I just add this, we'll get that one sale. That's quite dangerous territory because you, you end up you know, um, pleasing one person and not everybody. So you're going to add, you're gonna, you'll end up being told by business we must do it. You'll add in this little bit of technical debt. Once they're on, the onboarding and the training guys will start to say, well, it's not working, we need these changed and this fixed so it, we can get them on. Then when they are actually using the system, they'll report bugs. And then finally, you start to get what's periodic. By periodic, I mean, you, you didn't know that you needed an end of year tax report until it got to the end of the year and everybody started asking you for the tax report. So you know you're gonna get these requests. They're gonna come in this order and they're gonna cause you, you're gonna have to jump because business is saying it's a prudent, deliberate decision and you need to take that technical debt and log it so you can come. Because at some point, those demands will start to lessen and you get into the third stage which is business as usual. This should be the general so like churn of the product. And this is how you're gonna then survive for the rest of this, this product's life cycle. So there'll still be demands coming in from marketing or from our customers, but this is where you get to put back in your demands. You can say, we've, we've made all these compromises, we need time to go back in and fix them. So this is where you see at the bottom, the technology, it's where the dev and where you go, you have your chance to put back in so you can make sure things are getting fixed.